A fascinating and famous poem here by John Keats on seeing the Elgin Marbles. The Elgin Marbles are the basically the uh, impediments of the Greek temples that were taken from Greece by originally by the French and then were uh, captured by the British during the Napoleonic Wars and brought up to England. And those Elgin marbles are called such because Lord Elgin basically uh, confiscated them and he used them in order to create the British Museum. The marbles are the stones of the impediments, called that because they're made of marble. So it's when he looks at the Elgin marbles, he is looking at these Greek uh, statues and pillars and all those things that came from the friezes up above the, near the tops of the temples of Greece. Consequently, he's reflecting on something that seems eternal because it's been around for quite some time and certainly depicts something eternal, that is, the gods. And yet those marbles were very weathered, very worn and cracked and broken by the time that they were put into the British Museum. And so John Keats is also reflecting on how even these eternal seeming things are not really eternal. If they aren't eternal and he is looking at them, he's even less eternal. Keats knew from early on that he was a doomed man. He was suffering from tuberculosis and from the age roughly of 16 or 17, he knew he only had a few years to live and indeed he died in his early 20s of tuberculosis. So when he's writing this poem, he's thinking about the fact that he's looking at something which has been around for much longer than he has and yet itself is showing signs of aging and weathering. And he who is going to be on this earth for a brief while is showing signs of aging and weathering as well. Keats is frequently in his poems writing about how he's weak, a dull numbness pains his sense, he feels like he's going to swoon, etc., etc., etc. But he did have cause to, I think. And I think his use of that image of spirit being weak here is very appropriate. His spirit is too weak because it's so temporal. And he juxtaposes the word mortality to his spirit being weak in order to create a conflict between the two uh, realms, the two ideas. His spirit is weak not because he's just fainting over the marbles, but rather it's weak because it's mortal. It's not going to last forever. It's nothing compared to these very strong pieces of stone. And then notice the caesura, my spirit is too weak, and then the enjambment, mortality weighs heavily on me. He is He's, he feels the weight of mortality weighing on him almost like a stone. And yet, looking at these stones, the Elgin marbles, he is imagining pinnacles, right? Godlike hardship, all this, which reminds him that he has to die. So then the second question, he says, I'm like, I'm like a, a sick eagle looking at the sky, seeing this broad advance of, of, of possibility and open realms and yet like an eagle that can't access those realms. He's, he's looking up at that sky and, and thinking it's never going to fly. He's never going to be able to see the actual buildings of Greece. And yet, he has a turn of thought here, it's a gentle luxury to be able to weep because he doesn't have the, the, the responsibility of keeping the cloudy winds. Who does? Well, the gods do. The gods he's looking at there on the Elgin marbles have the responsibility of keeping the cloudy winds, he says. I don't have that responsibility. So I can weep over my condition. When you're in authority, you can't let people know that you're suffering or you're sorrowful or that you have made a mistake. And when you're not in authority, you have the luxury to be able to do that. And so in some ways, it's consolation to him. The gods have to keep the cloudy winds. Fresh, as he says, fresh for the opening of the morning's eye. So that when people wake up, they see the wind and the clouds and the skies. But then he goes into this interesting commentary where she says, Such dim conceived glories of the brain bring round the heart an indescribable feud. That is, there's a struggle within. When I start thinking about this, I'm mortal and I'm going to die and that's sorrowful. But if I were a god, I'd have to take care of everything. So is it better to be mortal and know you're going to die? Or is it better to be a god and have to take care of every drop of water and every grain of sand? So these things, he says, make me dizzy to think about them, looking at this, this, these two possibilities. 
mingles Grecian grandeur with the rude wasting of old time. And at the very end of the poem, he devolves into a series of caesuri that just almost truncate the poem into, into little bits so that his thought is broken up into little pieces, just as the Elgin marbles have been broken up into little pieces. I mean, when you see those marbles, those actual pieces from the Greek temples, they're broken into little bits. So his thought at the end of the poem, by this conception of maybe the thought of dying, the possibility of dying, is a blessing, has made his thoughts break up like little bits into like the Elgin marbles. And thus, he is in a way like a, like a, like a god in this possibility of dying. 